lost uh, in, in the daily insanity, which is life in the Middle East, uh, is not only the fact that uh, Israel is tiny and democratic and Jewish, uh, but that it is also arguably the most creative country on earth. Uh, we're talking about a population that's the size of the GTA, a geography that's not much larger. Uh, under constant pressure, indeed assault, a daily struggle for sheer survival. And yet somehow this society, these people find the time, the energy, the capital, to uh, be really the greatest technology innovators on earth, um, highly devoted to literacy, an extremely arts-oriented society. It's an interesting question, how come? And uh, the man who decided to write about that and uh, try and come up with an answer is Saul Singer. He's with us here today all the way from Jerusalem. He and his partner, Dan Center, published a book called Start Up Nation. It has rapidly become a blueprint for many societies, many countries looking for rapid development. Saul, so come out here. Well, as Moses said, the reason that Dan Senor and I decided to write this book was we realized something pretty obvious but neglected, that Israel has the highest concentration, the highest density of high-tech startups of any country on the planet. There are more startups in Israel than any place outside of Silicon Valley. If you look at all of Europe with 700 million people, produces about 500 or about 700, 800 startups a year. Israel with 7 million people produces about 500 startups a year. And perhaps even more significantly, if you look in terms of venture capital, Israel receives about two and a half times as much per capita as the United States, about 30 times as much as Europe. But this was really just the, the kind of eye-opener. The, the more interesting question was why? Why did this happen in Israel? That's what we wanted to figure out. And we quickly realized that it was a question of culture and that a culture is best to tell with stories. So we tell lots of stories, and one of them is about a man named Scott Thompson, who's head of a company called PayPal that you may have run into. And the main investor in PayPal was actually, uh, the bought PayPal was eBay, and the main investor in eBay was Benchmark Capital. And Benchmark is one of those venture funds that was going around Israel looking for startups. And they found this tiny place called Fraud Sciences, that decided it was going to tackle the problem of credit card fraud. So they asked Scott Thompson, the expert on this issue, to check out the company. And Thompson, you know, is meeting with this young Israeli named Scott Shvat Shaked, one of the founders, and uh, he doesn't have a lot of time, but he asked him, okay, so how did you do with this scheme of yours? What is your scheme to beat credit card fraud? And he said, well, I was in the Israeli army, like most Israelis, and our job was to try to track terrorists over the internet. And we quickly realized that there, we had this idea that there are you know, good people and bad people. And the bad people don't leave a lot of traces of themselves on the internet. And the good people, they leave passwords, usernames, all kinds of stuff. You look for that stuff, you've got good people. You don't find stuff, you've got bad people, and you solve the problem. So, you know, Scott Thompson is now thinking to himself, I, you know, I can't believe I'm sitting here, I'm this busy executive. I don't want to hear stories about good people and bad people and terrorists. But, you know, he has to humor him because Benchmark asked him and he says, so how do you do with the scheme of yours? And he says, Scott Shaked says, well, we've been at it for five years, we've gone through 40,000 transactions, we only got 14 wrong. So this is interesting, but not really for a company the size of PayPal. So then Thompson gets a brilliant idea, thinks he's going to get rid of this guy. He says, okay, I'll give you 100,000 transactions that PayPal actually processed, and we'll have to scrub the names for privacy reasons, but you take the data and you see what you can do. Shvat Shaked goes back home to Israel. A few days later, Scott Thompson gets a two-word email. We're done. 
They've gone through it all. Scott Thompson gives all the data to his top 50 PhD engineers. They're pouring through it. It takes them a week. They're not sure, but they get the idea that on the transactions that PayPal had the most trouble with, fraud sciences had done 17% better. So this is, of course, a game changer for an industry like this. Thompson thought it would have taken PayPal, which was the cutting edge of the industry, five years to get to a result like this. And uh, so he goes running to Meg Whitman, who was then head of eBay, and says, we can't let Benchmark invest in this company. We can't let anybody else invest. We have to buy this company. So they make an offer, $80 million. And uh, a few days of negotiations, they agree on $180 million. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the next thing you know, Scott Thompson is on an airplane to a country he probably never thought of before, to Israel, and to see the company that he bought. And he shows up there, and he's speaking to the whole company, a group much smaller than this. And, uh, you know, they're listening rapidly, which actually didn't sound to me very Israeli. Uh, usually they'd be texting and whatever. But uh, Thompson told us they listen, you know, very rapidly. And then he opens it for questions. And he's expecting questions like, you know, you just bought us. How is this going to work with a merger? You know, none of that. It's all... Why do you do business this way? Why are you structured that way? Why does PayPal, you know, tough questions about their business model, and he's beginning to get a little nervous up there. And he's thinking, I thought I bought this company. It's like they bought me. <laughs> and, you know, you see a lot of things in this story that come up a lot in the book. Uh, one thing that jumps out is the kind of lack of respect for authority, uh, the lack of interest in hierarchy, uh, the fact of, uh, you know, young, People, these 20 something kids who started this thing, you know, they came up with an idea. It didn't matter that there's a tens of thousands of people in an industry that exists that's doing it one way, they're going to turn it over and do it another way. All these things are typical of startups of Israel. And I think that actually there's a very interesting lesson about the nature of innovation itself from Israel. And that is that if you put the word innovation, into Google Images, you can try this, uh, you will get lots of pictures of light bulbs. Because we, we, we think of innovation as the idea, and the symbol is the light bulb. But I don't think that's really the case, because if you look around the world, you know, a good metric for ideas is patents. And if you look around the world, Israel is number one in medical device patents per capita, but not number one in every category. And there are a number of countries that have roughly the same number of patents per capita as, as Israel does. And yet they don't, these other countries don't have nearly the same number of startups. So evidently the light bulbs are going off, but they're, they're not producing the startups. So we realize that, that there are really two other big ingredients that go into, that turns ideas into startups and innovation. And one of them is drive, determination, you could call it chutzpah. Uh, mission orientation, I think, is a good word for it. That constellation. And another is the willingness to take risks. And if you don't have those two elements, this kind of mission orientation and willingness to take risks, you can have all the ideas you want. You're not going to get startups. So then the question became, why does Israel have more of those things? And we, this is where most of the book is spent on. There's, we talk about seven, eight factors. I'll just mention three. Uh, first of all, that Israel itself, as a country, is a startup, uh, when you think about it. It took a lot of drive and determination and willingness to take risks for Israel to be there in the first place and to exist over the past 63 years. That's one thing. So this kind of atmosphere is in the air. Another is the military. The fact that, and it's not the way most people think of the military, that the technology comes out of the military, or certain high-tech units. Yes, we talk about those in the book, and they, they do produce a lot of startup people. But the main effect, we think, is actually cultural, in the sense that Israelis have this third stage in life that's between work on the one hand and, and school on the other. And it's a stage where they get leadership, they get teamwork, they learn about what a mission is, about what it means to take risks, when, what it means to improvise when you don't have enough resources. But most important of all, I think it's this idea of what a mission is. That what it means to be given something you have to do no matter what, improvise, 
lives depend on it, and you have to get it done. And that's not something you necessarily get. Also sacrifice, sacrifice for something larger than yourself. That's very important. These are things that you don't necessarily get in school and you don't necessarily get in business. And it makes Israel, Israelis more driven and more willingness to take risks. Um, a third factor is immigration. It's a huge thing. Almost everybody in Israel is themselves an immigrant or their parents or their grandparents. And it's the only country I know of where politicians actually compete with each other promising to bring in more immigrants, not, not less. Um, and immigrants are natural, naturally driven. They were driven to go from one place to another. And they're natural risk takers. And it's not a coincidence. There's another book out called Immigrants, Inc. that points out that half of the startups in Silicon Valley were started by immigrants. So Israel is a country of immigrants. So you have, again, a lot of this mission orientation and willingness to take risks. So I want to say something, though, about the impact of all this and the ways that, that Israel's had an impact that's much greater than you'd expect from a small comp country. One of them, one of the ways is through very big companies. Um, you know, you think of startups as they are small, they're cute, they have technology. I mean, but how much impact do they really have? They're so tiny. But Israel's impact has largely been through some of the largest tech companies in the world, like Intel, Microsoft, Google, IBM, Cisco, you name it. They're in Israel in a very important way. They've bought companies, they've built R&D centers, they've developed the key things. For instance, you know, Intel alone, the, the IBM, the original chip and the original IBM PC back in ancient history was developed uh, in Israel. And then going through to the Pentium and the Centrino, um, your cell phones, your, uh, you know, Google, Google suggests where you start typing and it starts popping down your suggestions as you're in, in between you type the letters. That was, that was scaled to the whole Google system through Israel uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's through these big companies, through this partnership, this kind of natural synergy between very large companies and startups. It doesn't have to be Israel, it doesn't have to be the US, but it's happened mainly between big American tech companies and Israeli startups has been a perfect synergy and it has tremendous impact. Uh, but I would watch for, as we're talking about what's next in the future, uh, some new realms of impact that are very exciting. One is, um, I would say, tackling global problems. Uh, later this year, I'm going to be able to buy a fully electric car, no tailpipe, and drive it anywhere I want in the country. A company called Better Place, which is, builds car infrastructure for electric cars to work, is going to basically replace on a mass scale, not, not talking about boutique hybrid kind of thing, get 20% increase in efficiency or, or, or reduce reduction in carbon and pay extra for that. I'm talking about cars that can compete with a gas car in every level, price, convenience, and they're 100% green. So this is happening in Israel. Now it's happening in Denmark and next in Australia, which will show that it's not just for, big, big, uh, not just for small countries. Um, I think this is an incredible model of how a small country can take a global problem, implement a solution, as the founder says, Shai Agassi says, he's kind of treating Israel as a beta country. You know, this is a place to demonstrate a solution to a global problem in a way that other countries can copy. And I very much hope that Israel does this, you know, with education, with uh, health, with water, with you name it. And, you know, as I speak around the world in different places, uh, one of the things that, that other countries are interested in is how can we kind of do this without the kind of adversity that Israel's faced? And, and I think one of the messages here is Adversity can be one kind of driver, but you know, America, the United States doesn't have adversity anywhere like Israel does, and yet they produce Silicon Valley. It doesn't have to be adversity that drives you. It could be the motivation to tackle world problems, to make a difference in the world. For one, for even small countries, for large countries, to make a difference. And this is actually goes to uh, an important thing about this whole process, which is that, you know, 
Israel itself, as I said, was a startup started from a dream uh, and started with a lot of mission and hard work and risk taking. But, you know, that was one form of pioneering, like making the desert green, uh, draining the swamps and, and so on and so forth. You know, that was maybe the grandparents' generation. But what's exciting about Israel today is that the, the high tech sector, all these startups, they see themselves as the new pioneers. They see themselves as creating things that are not only good for their country, but good for the world. And this is kind of the new, the new form of pioneering in Israel. Um, and it's, it's very exciting to see how this can be taken and, and spread throughout the world. In fact, um, you know, uh, the theme of this conference is ideas having sex. Uh, but I would say, you know, while there's a lot of emphasis in, and we all know that individuals can have a tremendous impact on the world, that a single person, and these are the, inspire, the stories that inspire us all is how, how individuals can have an impact. I think we should also keep in mind that, that countries, uh, that small countries, that s large countries can kind of, if they're focused on it, can have an impact on the world. And even more so if you combine the strengths of two countries. For example, you know, Israel is very good at startups. We're lousy at all kinds of other things. We're lousy at doing big companies. We don't know how to do marketing. We don't know how to do sales. We don't know how to scale things up. Our entrepreneurs are always, they're always kicking themselves. Why can't we build big companies? Uh, and I always think this is funny because, you know, um, they kept saying, where's our Nokia? Because uh, that was their idea of a big tech company that came out of a small country called Finland. And now they don't say that so much because Nokia is not doing so well. But uh, I was so interested in this that for the book, I, I went to, to Finland via email and I asked someone there, you know, what do you think of Israel? And he said, oh, you know, Israel has so many more startups. We're able to, Israel uh, gets, each of those startups gets on average more, much more investment than, than ours do. And they're able to turn over more quickly, which he thought was a good thing. So I quickly realized that what, while Israelis have what I call Nokia envy, the rest of the world has startup envy. You know, and, you know, President Obama has announced Startup America and in England, Cameroon has, announced Startup Britain, and everyone is trying to figure out how to do startups. And while Israelis take for granted that they're good at startups, and they want to know how to do big companies. Well, I, I think the answer is actually neither. The, act, the answer is for every country to kind of do what it do, does best and combine the strengths of each country and get something, get that synergy out of it. So I'm going to end with, um, Shimon Peres, President Shimon Peres, we interviewed for three hours. We quoted him probably more than anybody else in the book. And he said a couple inspiring things. One is that to be Israeli is to be dissatisfied. I love that. But the other is that sometimes the most careful thing is to dare. And that's the story of startups. It's the story of Israel and the story of startup nation. Thank you. Saul, Saul does his best, uh, I think he does very well, in, in abstracting the discussion and getting away from any ethnic references. But there is an important technology writer, his name is George Gilder, some of right. you may have read him, and he says about Israel that it concentrates the genius of the Jews. That's a, another great book. Another great the, book. The, he wrote The Israel Test. Right. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you coming here. Good story. Thank you.